What's up, cool dogs? All right, today I have with me Ryan Mitchler from the Order of Man uh, podcast, as, as he's most famously known for. And I want to bring him on because I, I really like what he has to say as far as being a man and, and the way that he's built his business and his sort of view of masculinity. So I, I wanted to, to talk about that today, talk about how you guys can become a better man. You know, I, I talk about on this channel how I teach you how to become a man. Uh, how about how do you become a better man, right? Um, so welcome, Ryan. Glad to be here, John. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to have you uh, to talk to you today because uh, you know uh, you're definitely one of the the people in the space that I, I highly respect uh, because you 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 know you you seem to stick to your principles, which is uh, I think one of the the very uh, key characteristics of, of being a man. Uh, maybe uh, for everyone that's not familiar with you perhaps a little bit of a background of, of what you do and, and kind of how you got involved in this this area. Yeah, yeah. So we've got the Order of Man podcast and movement. Uh, we started it in, <clears throat> I think, March 24th was our six-year anniversary. So we started in oh, 2015, wow. uh, primarily with a podcast. Uh, at this point, I think we've done over 330 interviews with highly successful men, but we've done I, I believe it's over 750 podcast shows at this point. So oh, wow. nice. yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And really my goal is to take the information from the guests that I have on and mm. break it down, break down their experience, distill that information into something that's going to be applicable and practical for uh, the men who tune in. Cause my ultimate objective is to help men uh, become better fathers, husbands, business owners, community leaders. So whatever I can do to help them on their path, uh, via conversations or programs, things like that, that we may offer. Uh, that's my goal. And, you know, frankly, I, I, I feel like I'm the biggest recipient, the biggest beneficiary of what it is I'm doing. Uh, every, every once in a while, I, I had this more when I started, not so much anymore, but occasionally I'll have somebody who will reach out and say, yeah, who, who are you to talk about manliness and masculinity? And I, I've never made any claim to be the epitome of, of masculinity and in the highest uh, objective that a man should strive for. I'm on the path just like everybody else. And, uh, fortunately I've had the opportunity to connect with powerful men and take that information and pass it down to other people who want to hear about it. Yeah, no, I love that approach. I think that's, that's a re really, really great because we all have something to learn. We're always going to be on this journey. You know, we're never going to be there. Uh, right. I like what you said also about, I mean, just that, I think that's a big challenge that, that we kind of all face as men. And, and even especially as content creators is that when someone says, who are you to, you know, uh, you know who, why do you have the authority to talk about this, this subject? And I yeah. think a lot of people are stifled because they, you just, you can't ask for permission. You just have to go and do something. Right. Well, and I, and, and the way I look at it is that's up for you to decide, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, if you want to tune into what we're doing and you get value from something I might say, or something, one of my guests says, then you've given me some of that, that authority, that, that credibility. And if you right. tune in and you think, oh, I don't like what this guy has to say or, or, or he doesn't resonate with me, that's fine. There's plenty of people who don't. And, uh, but you have to decide for yourself. You know, it's funny. We live in this really strange time where everybody thinks they're owed something and, and, mm -hmm. and, and everybody out there has to acquiesce to their requests. And I, I'm going to run it how I want to run it. And if you're interested in tuning in and you feel like it'll serve you, great. If you're not, then that's great too. I, I, would, I would suggest that you go out and find – one of uh, 10 million other people you could listen to on whatever subject you want to, you want to hear about in the way that you want to hear it, but it's not my job to make you feel comfortable about it. Yeah, no, I like that approach. That's it's so important today because in this world of social media, everything, you know, a lot of people are trying to get likes. So they're doing things in order to conform to the, the judgments, the, the values of other people, as opposed to having their own value system, their own judgments as, as men. So I think that's, yeah. Really important. You know, the other thing too is chasing likes. I, I mean, we all get wrapped up in it, especially as you're trying to grow something, grow a business or a brand or a message. It's, it's easy to get wrapped up into. I was thinking about it the other day though. I, I, I see accounts that have, you know, uh, 500,000 followers or a million followers or whatever it might be. And, and you think, oh, this person might, must be doing something right. But that doesn't really translate to deep and meaningful impact. You know, that right. might be a meme account where people can, you know, laugh and, and, and have a quick, you know, 10 second laugh and then move on with their day. But what drives me is that I can talk with a guy who will send me a message or, or an email and he'll say to me, hey, man, I just want you to know I've been listening to your podcast for a year. And uh, my when we started listening, my wife and I were almost going to have a divorce. 
And because I implemented some of the stuff that you and your guests talk about, we're actually fixing it. And I'm more connected with my kids and I'm getting strong and I'm starting a business. And that to me is significantly more valuable than somebody just mashing that like button. Exactly. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. It's the impact that you're having. It's, it's better to have people that you're actually influencing their lives rather than a, a huge audience. And, and the thing is, you know, the you're never going to be liked by it. If you're liked by the crowd, then, um, you know, that's uh, <laughs> then you have to cater to the crowd, right? So, yeah, well, if that's what you're chasing, right? If you're yeah. chasing the validation and approval of the crowd, then you have to appease the crowd and you don't get to say what you actually want to say because you're so worried about how it might per be perceived by others. I mean, let's be straight though. I, you know, wh what I say and how I say it is important. Mm -hmm. I want right. it to land. I want it to resonate with the men who will be impacted by what I do, but I'm not pandering. I'm not waffling. I'm not like you talked about earlier, changing my opinion or perspective or viewpoint just so somebody will happen to like what it is I have to say. Exactly. Exactly. Now tell me, I think that a good place to, to, to start also would be to talk about what it is for you as far as what defines a man or being masculine to you. What are the kind of the key characteristics that you, you know, how you would describe it? Yeah, you know, so I, I did a podcast on this a couple of weeks ago, and we, we use these terms like male and man and masculinity and manliness. We, we use all these terms interchangeably, generally. Mm -hmm. and, and I made the distinction that there's a difference between being a male, being masculine, and being right. manly. There's a distinction between the three. Right. So being a male is a matter of biology. That, that's it. Right. You know, a, a, as long as you have the right biology and, and makeup and, and, you know, the, uh, anatomy, then, then you're a male, right? That's what makes you a male. That's why my boys are male. That's why I'm a male, et cetera, et cetera. Masculinity is a set of virtues and characteristics that are driven by your biological makeup. So mm -hmm. when we think of what masculinity is, you think of generally uh, aggression, dominance, uh, physical strength, uh, right. stoicism, uh, competitiveness, if I didn't already say that. These are all masculine characteristics they're 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 generally speaking more predominant in men and they're driven hormonally and then they're supported societally so a lot of people will say well you know this, these are all just so social constructs N no they're not social constructs they're biological constructs and they're supported societally because they work and the right. only time that's come into question is relatively recently as we've we've created this life of of ease and comfort where we can actually question what it means to be a man and a woman. So you've got male, you've got masculinity. And then the third component is manly or manliness or a man. And that's taking those characteristics, strength, aggression, dominance, competitiveness, stoicism, taking those masculine traits and virtues and harnessing them into productive outcomes for yourself and the people that you have an obligation and responsibility for. So when I talk about manliness i talk about it in a in a context of a framework so right. the framework that that works for me and that has been espoused through generations throughout all of culture and all of history is that a man is to protect provide and preside which is synonymous with leadership and right. if a man is using those masculine characteristics to protect himself and others to provide for himself and others and to lead himself and others, then he's acting in a manly matter. And that's what defines or makes a man. I love that. I, I like the distinction between those because I think those things do get mixed up a lot. It, it reminds me a lot of, uh, you know, Jack Donovan's The Way of Man, where he was talking about, you know, what makes, what makes a man is different than being a good man. And that really resonated with me when, when I read that. And that's, you know, so, so you're, if I'm understanding correctly, you're, definition of manliness is actually being a good man, uh, applying those, those things for, you know, the, the masculine attributes for the good of, of others. Yeah. So what you're referencing with Jack and David Gilmore talked about this in a book called manhood in the making, which is a very mm -hmm. interesting read. Uh, it's, it's a little bit clunky and hard to read for me because it's more, uh, research, based and scientific approach to what it means to be a man, which is kind of hard at times, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so both Jack, who's a friend of mine, he was just on the podcast not too long ago, a week or so ago. Uh, he makes the distinction between being a good man right. and being good at being a man. 
Right. And the way that I look at that, based on what he said and other things I've read, because I agree with that, good has to do with morality, right and wrong, virtuous living, right? You're you're a righteous individual, or you're striving to be, or you're you're wicked, and you're you, you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, taking advantage of other people, et cetera, et cetera. That's what it means to be a good man. Mm. But there's another component of this: good at being a man. So this is actually capability it's physical strength it's your right. skill set it's your ability to do what you need to do so we we've got a bunch of guys in society who are running around and they're good guys right. you know they're nice they're friendly they're, they're trying to do right by people uh but a lot of the times they might get taken advantage of they're the right. nice guy they get railroaded they're probably not as healthy as they should be they're getting passed over for promotions great guys nice guys but not good at being men necessarily. And right. you have to have both. You have to have the morality and the capability. Now we have other guys in society running around who are very capable, very mm. capable, strong, assertive, very capable, has, has a set of skill sets, but they're not moral men. Right, right. And that doesn't make a great man. That's a male, sure, but they're not harnessing masculinity for productive outcomes, like I said earlier. So I think you have to have the marriage of both. You've got to have the morality, being a good man, moral, and being good at being a man, capable. When you marry and combine the two, man, you, you become unstoppable. Yeah, no, I agree with you uh, 100%. I think it's a lot of what I, what I see is that whole like nice guy versus asshole dichotomy. It's this false dichotomy, right? It's because sure. in general, we, we have so many weak men that are when they're morally right, they're nice guys. And in fact, I would question whether nice guys are, are morally good uh, because it seems like they always have ulterior motives. They're always trying to get something from someone, but using manipulation tactics. But then you've got the assholes who are who represent masculinity, but don't have the the moral compass. They're not necessarily doing things. And, and but but I think a lot of guys they fall into this trap of thinking, well. I'm a nice guy, but I don't want to be an asshole. So I'm just going to be a nice guy. And they don't realize right. that there's this middle ground, which is the hardest road to navigate because it's a very narrow ground where you're, where you, you don't let people walk over you. You're strong, you're, you're firm, but you're also have compassion. Because so many guys, they, they go one way, they either like throw out all the compassion or they, they're, they're completely a pushover. And so what's the yeah. way to, to get guys to find that middle way? You know, the fact that somebody's bouncing back and forth between the two is actually a good thing. It mm -hmm. means they're trying to find the boundaries. You know, for example, when my, my son, he just turned 13 just a couple of days ago, and he's a little mouthier than he's been in the past. He's trying to assert himself a little bit more. He's definitely more independent than he's been up to this point. And it's, it's a challenge as his father to see those changes and to have to rein some of that in and make sure yeah. that he's talking to him and his mother, my wife, uh, appropriately, you know, there's things that are challenging about it, but it's also good. It means he's trying to find his place in the world. And because I'm his father and his mother is very active and involved as well, we can help him navigate those changes. Some, some guys never get that. Right. Right. And so if you're a nice guy, sometimes you actually have to be the asshole to figure out where the line is. Yeah, and if you're the well. asshole, sometimes you have to be maybe a little bit more nice or get railroaded a couple of times to realize, ah, I went too far. So the right. fact that you're going back and forth between the two says that you're trying to find where that, that perfect combination lies. So here's something I learned years and years ago about communication, and this ties exactly into what you're saying. So we have four primary communication styles. We have passive, mm -hmm. which is the nice guy, right? has ideas, has thoughts, but won't share them, is afraid of what, how it'll be perceived, gets railroaded, gets passed over pr for promotions, uh, can't ever get the date, all that kind of stuff, right? Then you have the aggressive guy. You know, this is the asshole that we're talking about. He railroads everybody. He, he, he pushes them around. Uh, he asserts his dominance regardless of how it might come across or the wake of collateral damage he might leave in, in his path. He gets what he wants now, but long term, he has to move around a lot. He jumps from job to job. He might move cities right. because nobody likes him. He's a dick. Right. He gets what he wants, but nobody likes him. And so he has to move on to take advantage of somebody else. The third, com the third communication style is passive aggressive. So this is an aggressive individual, but they don't want to necessarily come across like that. So they will make little snarky comments. They'll, they'll backstab people. 
Uh, they'll undermine it every opportunity. They make a joke of everything. I mean, having a, having a right. laugh is one thing, but turning everything into a joke and making people feel stupid is actually an aggressive style of communication, but you're just doing it passively so nobody interprets you as the asshole. All right. The fourth component or, or communication style is really where most of us should try to get, and this is what you're talking about. It's uh, assertive. Right. Assertive. All right, so you've got thoughts, you've got ideas, you've got goals and ambitions and desires. You're willing to communicate those to people. You're willing to work towards them. You're willing to ask things of people that you might need. You're also willing to see how that might be perceived and how it comes across and how you can serve and help other people get what it is they want. This is where we want to work. And not any of us is always an assertive communicator. I've learned to be more assertive via the podcast because that's how you're going to lead a good podcast discussion. But there's other times where I might take it too far and be a little bit more passive or turn into an aggressive type communicator. So long story short, when you step over the line, that's actually a healthy thing because it's an indicator that you're trying to figure out what the line is. You just have to be aware of it, analyze it, and then make course corrections along the way. Yeah, no, I really love that approach. I think that's, that's very true. I, I, a lot of the guys that I coach on like starting a YouTube channel, for example, or podcast, it's the same thing I talk about or writers, they have to find their voice, right? So it's yeah. like you, you go one way and you're like really extreme one way and maybe you use a bunch of profanity in your, <laughs> you know, and then maybe you, you like try to like be really like neutral and then you kind of find where, where does it fit in is I, I, I like that approach in life. I think a lot of guys that try what you're saying, they get people telling them, stop trying to just be yourself. Stop trying to stop trying to fake it. Don't, don't be a poser. Right. And it's and, and that's that's a shame because you decide who you want to become in life and you have to try out the different things in order to become what you're actually meant to be. Uh, well, think about that term. Just be yourself. What does that even mean? Does does right. be yourself mean be less than you're capable of? Because that's really what people are saying. Right. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Okay, well, I'm not as good at things right now that I'd like to be. So is that what you're telling me to do? Just settle for that? Right. I think be yourself means work towards who you are capable of becoming. Exactly, yeah. You know, you would never, for example, you would never criticize a, a young athlete who, let's say, plays football or, or, or she plays soccer or what, whatever it is. You would never criticize that young athlete for, for trying out on teams, for practicing day in and day out, for focusing on the details, for locking in their diet, for being in the gym because they want to reach the pinnacle of, of their sport, you know, professional sports or an Olympian. You would never criticize that person for saying you're a poser or, you know, you're faking it. No, they're not. They're actually working towards what they, they're not there yet, but they're right. deliberately working towards getting there. So we hear that when people start podcasts or a YouTube channel, like, oh, you sound like a poser. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm out here putting my voice out and trying and experimenting and, and, and trying to find my voice and how I'm going to resonate, what feels comfortable for me. Man, that doesn't make me a poser. That means I'm, I'm working towards becoming something more than I currently am, not settling for what I, I am today. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And in fact, I, I think that who you truly are is what you desire to become, right? Like, so those desires that you have to like change yourself, to become something or to do something that it's not you faking it or, or being, being something you're not, it's, it's who you are. It's like your real self. Like you have all this cruft that is preventing you from being your true self. And, and those are the things that are pushing you in that direction is that's why you want to, to, you know, try on this new uh, way of being is because that's who you actually really are. Yeah, I'm, I might push back just on that just a bit mm -hmm. because I, I know a lot of people who have desires, but they aren't willing to back that up with any action. And so mm -hmm. that's not really who they are. It's just dreams. It's just wishful thinking. I, right. I think you are who you're working to become is probably a more accurate statement because that includes desire, but it also includes action and you striving towards getting there. You know, am I going to be be an incredible influencer. If I'm too afraid to communicate right. with other people, I have that desire. Is that who I am? No, it's not. If I'm not actively working towards it. So I do think you have to have both the desire and the action to back it up because yeah, you and I both know 
plenty of people who say they want a thing, but have never even remotely taken one step towards that thing. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think, I, I guess I would say that it's who your potential is. Your desire is kind of, I agree with potential, that, but I not agree. everyone reaches their potential. Not most people don't ever reach their potential or anywhere closer. They don't realize what they're capable of. They have, uh, what Carol Dweck would call the, the fixed mindset of the growth mindset. Right. But, well, um, potential is an interesting thing too, because it's a moving target. So mm -hmm. you, you, let's say we'll go back to this young athlete we were talking about earlier. So they, uh, let, let, let's say they're playing football in, in high school and they want to go on to play college ball. Okay. Well, they work out, they train, they, they drill and, and they do everything they need to do. And they thought, okay, well, my, my potential is me reaching the college level. And then they get, they get, tapped on the shoulder and they get a scholarship and they go get to play football. Now, did they reach their potential? No, it moved. Right. <laughs> right now, right. now they're, they're capable of playing at the college level, but now because they're at that level, maybe they're capable of playing at the professional level. It, it's a moving target. It's a very weird thing. Cause I've always said that I want to reach my potential. Yeah, <laughs> I do. And then I want to, yeah. and then I want to have more potential. Like I want, so I want to hit that level and then I want to, okay, like what's next. And this is actually something I kind of struggle with a little bit yeah. because I will set goals for myself and then I'll hit them Yeah, because I work towards them. And, and my wife gets after me a little bit because she'll say things like, well, why can't you just be happy that you're here? It's like, well, right. I am happy. I'm glad. But I, by the time I reach the thing before I even reach the thing, cause I know I'm going to hit it. So before I even reach the thing, I'm like, okay, that that's done. What's next. And I'm always thinking about what's next because I want to unlock those new doors that weren't open to me before. Or maybe they were and I just wasn't in the position where I could recognize them or even think that I could be knocking on those particular doors. That wasn't for me. That was a closed door for me. It's not for me, but now I see it. Yeah, yeah. I think a, a lot in terms of goals, I, you know, I think being content but hungry is important. And then I, I kind of see it as like you, you climb a hill and once you're up that hill, now you can see over the hill to see where the next hill is, but you can't see right. the next hill until you climb the, the first hill. And and then also, you know, the, the whole thing with goals, like, I, cause I struggled in my life too. I, I retired when I was like 33, like, you know, quote retired, you know, didn't have to work. And that was my whole goal in life. And I was most miserable than I'd ever been in my whole life. Most yeah. depressed after achieving financial independence. I was like, what is, what is wrong? And the reason why is because to me, goals was a destination instead of now my viewpoint of a goal is a goal is something that points me in a direction that I want to grow. And mm -hmm. that's the whole purpose. And the reason why I keep on setting new goals is not because I want more stuff or, you know, or whatever. It's because I want to grow that direction. So I set my goal based on where I want to grow. Yeah. Financial freedom is an interesting thing because a lot of people think that that is the goal. I want to be financially free or I want to have so much money in the bank account. That's just a marker. It's a measurement sure. really is what it is. It's, it's money is a, is, is a measurement of perceived value. Right. That, that's all it is, is that somebody thought you were valuable enough to give you money. And if you amass ama enough of it because you were valuable to other people in a way that was meaningful to them, then you're going to build wealth. But that isn't fulfilling in and of itself. It is actually the value that you're adding that's fulfilling. And so once you reach that level of financial independence, you got to in your mind, your body, your soul, I think. You, you want to continue to add value. You want to be valuable. You want to yeah. contribute. You want to have meaning and purpose to your life outside of just what the money offers you. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not knocking building wealth. I mean, look, yeah. I want to, I want to make as much money as possible. Sure. But I also want to play catch with my son and wrestle with, with my daughter and build things together and, you know, the, go on vacations and have experiences, which by the way, can all be afforded through money. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I tend to look at things term in terms of like who you become is what brings you fulfillment, not what you have. Right. It's, it's like at the, at the end of the day, when you go to bed at night, it's like you could have a lot of money, you could have a lot of success in other people's eyes. But if you know you didn't put in the work that you were capable of, you know, at least me, I feel like a failure. I feel like I messed up. Whereas, you know, so, so it's like it's who I'm becoming. It's what I'm doing that matters to me. Cause I could lose again from a stoic mindset, right? If I lose everything, what else do I have? The only thing I guess the Stoics would say that the only thing that you have is what's left after you lose everything. That's the only thing you truly have. Yeah. Yeah. I heard this, uh, th this phrase, a friend of mine, in fact, my co-host on one of our podcast shares this. he says, it's the, it's the be do have attitude. 
Mm. So most people, have you heard this? A little, yeah. Go ahead and say it again. So a lot of people operate their lives from the have, uh, do, be mindset. So if I only had, right, once I have, then I can do blank and then I'll be happy. Right, right. Right. I have to have first so I can do whatever it is I want to do and then I'll be fill in the blank with whatever your adjective is of, of how you're feeling about yourself. Okay. And and he showed me, he's like, flip that around. It's it's the be, uh, have, do, right? right? So instead of the instead of the instead of the now I'm getting all confused here. Instead of the be do have, it's the have do be, right? So you switch it and you reverse it. So you can be happy right now. You can be right. fulfilled right now. And if you are, then you will do whatever it is you want to do. And then you'll have whatever it is you have or want to have. But you have to be first. Right. You have to be first. And most people flip that completely backwards. Exactly. And, and the sad thing is a lot, of, a lot of people live their whole life thinking once I get that promotion, once I reach this point, then I'll really live my life. Because right. they, they once I have that title, right? Exactly. And then, yes. but, but the thing is that your external flows from your, in, your internal, who you become determines what you, what you have ultimately and, and what, you, right. what you, what you achieve in life. And so you have to become the thing first. That's right. Uh, That's right. Which is easy. It, it, it's easy to say it's hard in theory, especially if yeah. you've never addressed it before is like, well, just be content, be happy, be grateful for what you have. It's like, well, I'm not though, you know, and and, and right. I see everybody else out there who has more than I do and I'm comparing myself to them. And these are all traps that I fall into. Why don't I have this many downloads? Why don't this many people yeah. follow me? Why am I not getting these opportunities? But if I really stop and actually put any amount of time of, of thinking into it, feeling into it, man, I, I, I actually have a pretty incredible life. I've got four kids. I've got a beautiful wife. We live in this, on this property. We've moved here a couple of years ago. Um, I have a, a job and a career that's fulfilling and rewarding to me. And the more that I am present with what I'm doing here, the more fulfilled I am. And the more fulfilled I am with that, then I create and have more opportunities because it's a lot like uh, the, the parable of the talents in, in the mm -hmm. Bible. Yeah. Like, are you familiar with that story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the parable of the talents and I'm paraphrasing here, but one of, one of the individuals was given... Uh, one talent from his master and he was told to go out and, and utilize that talent and to go bring more back. And the other one was given, I think two talents and the other one was given five talents or something. And two of them basically just hoarded their money. They hoarded their yeah. talents. They didn't do anything with it. But the third went out and he, he magnified his talents. He put it to work and then he brought it back. And then the master actually took talents from the two that hoarded it and gave to the actual person who went out and made more of, of himself and his life and, and the talents. And, and that is like life. Some people will say, you know, if only I had, uh, if only I was making a hundred thousand dollars a year, bro, you can't even manage $30,000 a year. Right. What, what do you think if somebody magically bestowed a hundred thousand dollars a year on you, you think you'd be better off? I mean, you might have a few nicer cars. You might have an, another bedroom in your house. Uh, you might go to a different restaurant, but at the end of the day, you'd be the same person. Right. How about instead of worrying about that, why don't you learn how to be a better steward over 30,000? Because then that'll turn to 40, to 50, to 80, to 100, to 200, to a million. That's the proper way, but most people want to do it back. It's why lottery winners lose their money on average exactly. in a period of several years. Right. Yeah, they've got a bunch of money, but they didn't earn it. And therefore, they never learned the lessons to develop, to build, to, to hang on to that level of wealth. I was right. talking with um, Andy Frasilla, who a lot, a lot of people mm -hmm. listening are probably familiar with Andy. Yeah. Uh, and, and so Andy and I were sitting down and we were doing a podcast together. And I, I remember vividly, I said to him, you know, I, I imagine that if we could just magically plop myself into your shoes today, that I, it would just the weight would destroy me. And he mm -hmm. wasn't saying it arrogantly or e with ego or anything. He says it absolutely would. Mm -hmm. And and what he was saying is that he has developed the ability to shoulder that kind of responsibility, to shoulder oh, yeah. that level of activity and that level of action. And I just haven't yet. I can if I choose to. Right. But it takes time and you have to earn it. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A few things on that. I would say is one <laughs> is that money is a multiplier, right? And so it's yes. like often when times when people get money and they're and they're in the bad place, they're in the worst place when they get money because money it just multiplies what you have. If you're an asshole and you get money, you'd be more of an asshole. If you're a drug addict and you get money, you'll be more of a junkie. You know, if you're a good person, if you're a good steward, and you get money, you'll, you'll it'll enhance. You know, you'll 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 enhance that. And then, like you said, with the responsibility that are you know the yeah, um, I, one 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 example I have from that was I was training for ultra running for running you know hundred mile races I did that last year, and the amount of running I was running 60, 70, you know eighty mile weeks that like I couldn't just someone couldn't just pick that up you know what I mean no. it's like you had to like but and it seemed extreme because I was I was running like seventy mile weeks and lifting three times a week and doing all my stuff and it was like but to me it just felt like normal days because I had become accustomed yeah. to it. But it's it's like, I think people, they, they see someone doing a lot of things and they're like, oh, well, yeah, I can never do that. But it's like, no, what you do for a long period of time eventually becomes, you know, what, what was out of your reach becomes something that becomes the normal. It's like, you know, it's, it's normal to run a three hour run. It wasn't normal, but it became the normal and right. the normal thing. And I, I think that's important. Or they'll, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll dump their baggage on you, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So what they'll say is, oh, John, John, you shouldn't run run that much. You're going to hurt yourself. Right. You know, exactly. You're, you're going to, oh, you're pushing too hard. You're, you, and so there, because that's their belief and that's right. actually their reality. Yeah. If you did what John was doing, yeah, it would hurt you. You, right. you would be injured, but you built to that level. And so people filter it through their own lens. I used to do this when I was a financial advisor. And mm -hmm. then one of my uh, mentors that I hired called me out on it. I would sit down with a client and we would put together a plan for them. And we would tell them, okay, here's how you need to invest. Here's how much you need to invest and et cetera, et cetera. And I would always preface it with saying, hey, I know this is a lot of money, but you need to invest this amount on a monthly basis into these accounts. Okay. And one day my mentor called me out. He says, why do you always say that? And I said, what, what? He says, you always say, I know this is a lot of money. And I said, well, is it a lot? Of, it is a lot of money. He's like, it might be a lot of money to you. <laughs> yeah. What you're doing is you're taking your baggage right. and you're dumping it on your prospects. You don't know if that's a lot of money to them. And you're right. only creating barriers because you're saying that. And they're yeah. looking through a completely different lens and you're wanting them to, ha to wear your glasses. So when somebody's out performing the way that you were performing as you were training for these events, I don't say, well, oh, you shouldn't do that. You're going to hurt your knees or you're, you know, you're going to have back problems later on. I say, how in the world is this guy doing that? Right, right. I, I wanted to know how he's doing that. That's pretty incredible. And although I have no desire personally to run like that, I still want to know how in the world you've trained your body to get to that point where you can do that at sustainably and, and not injure yourself. That to me is more inspiring than me just trying to pull you down and tell you, telling you what your life should be like through my inferior lens. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. Now, now what about one thing I want to ask you about is, is about, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I don't want to call people out or, but there, there's a lot of guys, I would say, that are, are kind of subscribed to a philosophy of hating women, being very, very scared of marriage and long term relationships, right? I mean, some of these things, obviously, like I, I you know, are justified, but, uh, but, but I think it's a shame. And then uh, it, there's a lot of guys that are like just so hung up on, on, women in, in this, this, this whole thing, what's, what's your kind of take on, on all of this and, and, you know, in terms of being a man and, you know, obviously you've got a family, you're married, you have kids. What, what, what do you think about kind of what, what's being taught to, to young men today? I, I think in, in this particular space, there's a lot of victimhood mentality mm -hmm. where, where men are the victims and, and everybody and everything is out to get us and all women are bitches and society is horrible. And that typically comes from individuals who have been hurt and wounded in the past and haven't figured out how to deal with it like a mature individual. And so instead of dealing with it, what they'll do is they'll broadly apply isolated incidents to entire people or groups of people like all women are bitches, right? That's the things you hear. Like all women are gold diggers. All women are out to get you. You know, like I haven't experienced that. My, my, my mother, as I was growing up and she was raising me, didn't seem to 
exhibit any of that behavior. My wife certainly hasn't exhibited any of that behavior, you know, and there's other women in my life that I really admire and respect who don't behave and act like that. Now, I'm not saying that you should be reckless. In fact, when it comes to marriage, that's a very important thing. And I often talk with a lot of men about, hey, slow it down. Look for red flags. You know, it, don't, don't be thinking with your dick. Like, think about how this is actually going to impact the rest of your life. Don't rush into this. Be smart. If red flags pop up, talk about them. Address them. If they don't go away, maybe you do need to step back. Right. But if you've done your due diligence... I think partnering with a woman is a very, very powerful thing. It's radically transformed my life. And a lot of guys will say, well, you know, Ryan, oh, I don't need a piece of paper. That's what they'll say. I don't need a piece of paper to tell me that I'm committed. No, you don't. But I do think there is power in having a ceremony that actually signifies what it is you've committed to. Right? It, it's we're not going to do away with those traditions because that's what makes it real. That's what makes it tangible. That's what makes it important. And if you get, a, get, if you do away with those things, then I think you're probably more likely to take it less serious. I take my marriage very seriously because I made a commitment to her. And so I, I, I think that that's been a very powerful thing. Uh, you know, if, if, if you have some different thoughts, you know, I can certainly understand that, but let's not be perpetual victims. Right. And let's not just assume that because we had a bad experience, women do this too. You know, women, a woman who might be, uh, uh, physically or emotionally or even sexually abused may attribute that behavior to all men. Right. I right. understand that. That would, that would be a scary thing to deal with. And as a defense mechanism, I, I could see why a human being would attribute that or assign that to an entire group of people. Right. But it just isn't reality and it hinders your ability to grow and progress and create opportunities for yourself. So it is pretty saddening to see a lot of guys being talked out of partnering with women, uh, uh, committing to them. It's just been a powerful part of my life and I can't see – how not doing that would be better than what it is today for us. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I, I guess I would say that uh, my, the thing I don't like is the government's hand in it. I, I agree like, with that. Yeah. So, but, um, but, uh, but I do agree that the, the, the actual level of commitment is, is valuable. And then, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of arguments that guys would make, right. They would say, well, you know, uh, society today, dating apps, you know, Instagram, it changes. They, this is how women are now. They have very high lay counts, you know, in their 20s. And so they're not able to pair bond. They would say, what other arguments that, oh, well, women today, because of social media, again, they're only attracted to the, the hottest guy, the most attractive Chad guy. So I can't even get a woman anyway. You know, what, what do you say so to, the, to those? So here's, here's what I would say. Why wouldn't you want to be that guy anyways, regardless of whether or not yes. it attracts women? Like, why wouldn't you want to be ripped with low right. body fat, high testosterone, plenty of exercise, activity, you're making money hand over fist? Like, why wouldn't you want to be that guy? Right. Like, we, we, you're, you wear the right clothes, you're, you're doing the right things, you're advancing in your career, you have goals and ambitions. Every guy wants to be that, that individual, or they should. If, if, you're not, if you don't have a desire to be that, that seems very strange to me. But look, but Ryan, but Ryan, I can't do it because I'm short and I don't have the, the jaw, the genetics, yeah. the jawline. I'm look, I'm short. How tall are you, John? I'm, I'm six, three. So I'm, I'm okay. Tall. So you're tall. I'm yeah. five, yeah. ten. You know what I mean? So like, do you have, do you have a, look, here's the deal, John, if you and I go into, uh, if we were, if we were standing in a, in a, in a line and, and all the women were there and, and they could pick between me and you and all they knew about was their basic appearance and height, they would choose you. They, they would like, okay. that's reality. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny that, but you know what? There's a little bit more depth to each of us. Exactly. Right. And so if, if you're looking for women on Tinder, the guy who's jacked in six, three, yeah. Right. Yeah. He's going to get more swipes than the guy who's five ten, not as ripped. Maybe doesn't look as handsome. 
And so if that's where you're going, then you just put yourself at a disadvantage. But I don't, I, I, I mean, I've been out of the dating game for a long time, but that's not where you go to find a wholesome woman who you want to partner with. Right, right. Where do you find those women? Uh, church, business, networking events, activities that are, you know, wholesome and, 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 and good, like the gym right. and hiking and traveling the world. Like that's where you find, you don't find them at the bar. Yeah, no. In general, I think I think that's true. I think you can find some, but it's it's you're I'm not saying they're not there. Fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying improve your odds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's very true. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, again, so many guys today are being taught that that women only respond to looks, and it's probably because they're only on Tinder, right? They're only in those places on Instagram or everything's exactly. digital, especially in the wake of this COVID reaction. There's no, no physical interaction, and so yeah, when you're when you have to look at an, uh, an individual, whether it's a uh, romantic interest or even a, a potential job interview, yeah, this is a very visual device. Right. So, of course, that's what they're judging you on. Of course. No, no. What about the game? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, but there's things you can do to improve your chances, and there's ways that you can add and infuse other elements. Like, John there's certain advantages that I might have. I don't know what they are, but that I might have over you if somebody were to get to know each of us. Right. right exactly. And yeah. so I've got to level the playing field because I'm not six, right. <laughs> three, you know, you right. know what I mean? So, yeah. Now, now what would you say to guys that, you know, I think, I think one of the fears, I just did a video on this guys have this fear of, well, they, they have a fear of, of being divorced, raped and they're, their wife cheating on them and sexless marriages and all this stuff. And I mean, the guys, are, I mean, these are real problems, right? You know, again, I see the victim mentality here, but the guys that I see that have these problems, not all of them, not to, you know, blame them. I see them as weak men. And the reason why a lot of these problems occur is because they're not acting like a man. They're not very masculine in the relationship. They kind of let their wife, wear the pants, run all over them. They don't assert themselves as a man. And so of course she was a sexual interest in them. Uh, you know, when I say that guys get all bent out of shape and upset, oh, how can you blame men for this? But that's the reality with the guys that I coach that I see. Do you see something similar? Is there a different argument that you have for this? Because these are real problems. I mean, definitely guys yeah. get divorce rape, definitely guys have sexless marriages, you know, definitely guys have their wife cheating on them and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I, th I think I think what you're saying is probably pretty accurate for a lot of cases. I think there's another scenario that you just didn't vet your wife properly. Mm, yeah, you know I, that's that's very possible too. You, you were thinking with your wrong head, and it played out the way that it did, or you ignored red flags. You didn't talk about real issues while you were dating. You talked about life and experiences and all the fun and the money, and you didn't talk about religion or politics or how you're going to raise your kids or what each of you want to do for a career or do you want her to work and stay at home or what? You didn't talk about that stuff. So you didn't properly vet each other. Right. And that's a that's a problem. So that that's one problem. But yeah, I think you're right. I think the other problem is that you let yourself go. You know, you think you're hitched and uh, you know, you hear guys are like, well, you know, you can't see your friends anymore and you can't have your hobbies. I actually did that. My wife and I went through a separation uh, about 12 years ago. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I get it. I know what it's like. Okay. And there was some things that she needed to work on. There was, she was young. I was young. Uh, and she would be the first to tell you that she had to work on these things. But there was a lot of things that I failed to do. I let my friends go. I let my hobbies go. Yeah. I got yeah. fat. I, I, I became complacent. I ignored her because I was chasing my career. We stopped having experiences. I stopped being intimate with her and then she stopped being intimate with me to get back at me. There was a lot of stuff like that that went on that had I behaved and acted in a more manly matter, I don't think those issues would have come up. And if little things come up and they, they do in marriage and we've been married, this year will be 17 years, there's still little things that come up but because I'm acting manly, then we can talk about those. I can be assertive. We can address those. We can get back on track if the intimacy is suffering or the spark seems to be dimming. I acknowledge it. She acknowledges it. We talk about it. We make a plan and we improve. So yeah, there's a thousand different things that you can do as a man to ensure that this doesn't happen. I'm not saying it won't. 
I'm right. not saying it's going to work out 100% of the time. But I think more often than not, you won't find yourself in this position if you keep doing what, John, I'm sure you're coaching and what we've been talking about now for six years. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of guys, they want a guarantee in life. There's no Again. guarantee. And guarantee in what? Like, there's right. no guarantee. People say, well, you know, I just like this steady job, and so I, I can't start a business. Okay, right. well, you know, I can appreciate that, but what if your boss lays you off? Or what if this reaction to COVID happens and you're, you're, the business is shut down. There's no guarantee in life. I mean, you, you could look for some guarantees, but you're going to live a mediocre life. You're exactly. probably going to be miserable. You're going to look at what everybody else is doing and say, well, how come John has this and Ryan has that? And I wish I had that. Well, we have it because we took the risk. Exactly. We didn't need the guarantee. We just had some faith that we could make it work. And lo and behold, here it is working. Now I've had things that have failed and I've, got kicked in the in the dick and I picked myself up and dusted myself off and got back in the game and adjusted based on what I learned but those are the risks that pay off yeah no I mean yeah you're absolutely right I mean and it's the this the key of self-confidence true self-confidence is knowing no matter what happens you're gonna be okay yeah so that's exactly right and, and self-confidence is earned you know yeah. I, I know there's a lot of guys out there who believe that some guys just have it. It's the X factor. Right. <laughs> you can't really figure out what it is or, or why they have it, but that guy, he's just got it. No, he doesn't just have it. He earned that. He's won battles with himself. He, he keeps commitments to himself. He's in integrity. He's doing what he... So there's this concept I talk quite a bit about called the integrity gap, and it's the gap between what we know we should be doing and what we're actually doing. That's the integrity gap. And the larger that integrity gap is, the more dissatisfied, the, the more you'll lack confidence. But as you begin to bridge that gap and narrow the gap between what you know you should be doing and what you're actually doing, now your confidence increases. Your self-esteem, how, how you feel about yourself, and not surprisingly, how you start to carry and present yourself to the public changes. And people take notice of that. Potential right. employers, potential clients, uh, uh, romantic partners, they take notice of that and they attribute it to the X factor. I don't know what, you know what? I don't know about that. There's, I like that guy. There's something about him. I don't know what it is. I know what it is. You, John, know what it is. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a narrowing or bridging of that integrity gap. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's, that's very true. It's very true. The, the, the time when you're, when you're living outside of trust in yourself or – uh, you know, outside of what you know you should be doing, it, it's hard to have confidence. It's uh, you, you come off every interaction, it, it carries over with you. And it's weird because, you know, when we were talking about that lineup where, where, you know, women were choosing between me and you, you know, so we're standing there and they may not even know why they would choose one or the other just based on the look, but it exactly. might just be the way that I'm standing. Or exactly. maybe my, maybe my posture is just kind of like slouched or I can't make eye contact because I can't even right. look myself in the mirror. And there's like these little subtle clues that employers and clients and, and, and women look for. And they probably, for the most part, can't even identify what it is. And you can't identify what it is. But things change outside of your conscious thought when you're confident in who you are because you're working towards doing what you said you would do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, you know, you have micro expressions. There's so much stuff. That's why it's like when guys try and fake it, they try to pretend to be something instead of actually becoming the thing. It always ends up a failure because they're incongruent people detect that they know it right we, we 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 meet those people all the time we're like oh this this person i feel like they're not genuine they're not authentic and you just, you just there's something off about them and you you, you see it immediately you so. said it you said i mean you said there's something off that's that's again that goes back to the same thing there's something off about that person just like you'd say there's something i like about that person and we can't figure out what it is but it's the little subtleties and it's there and you can't fake your way out of it. You might be able to trick people temporarily or a few people, but at just that excessive pride and arrogance, that isn't earned. That's right. manufactured. Confidence, self-esteem, esteem, self-worth, that is earned and it can't be manufactured. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I agree. It's, uh, yeah, and, and, and so many guys are trying to have the image of being that, that manly man 
and uh, and they they don't actually have the true confidence. You know, they, uh, the arrogance versus confidence. Yeah, be 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 that guy, and yeah. then everything else will fall into place. Be be the per that goes back to the be do have thing we were talking about earlier that I slaughtered. Be that person, and the, these other things will will fall into place. Trust me, they will fall into place. You got to be it first. And we should probably wrap this, get wrapping this up. Um, before we do, though, well, first of all, guys, if you're watching or listening, go check out now. Go to orderofman.com. Go in your favorite podcast software and go subscribe to Order of Man. You're going to really enjoy the content that Ryan puts out. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're not a subscriber already, definitely go and, and download, go subscribe to the podcast. I also put a link to the YouTube channel in the, in the description below if you want to check that out. Uh, one, one other, one last thing I wanted to, to ask you about, Ryan, is uh, some books. I'm, I'm a big reader, and a lot of my audiences. What are some of the books that you recommend, especially on this topic of, of being a better man? And you know, yeah, uh, man, there's so many. Wild at Heart by John Eldridge is okay. a great book. A lot of Christian undertones in that, but still, so many wonderful principles that can be taken that from that that will help you understand about yourself. Yeah. Uh, Iron John by Robert Bly is another one. You've read that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a great book. Talks about the the wild man inside of us all and how to tap into that wild man and why we should. Uh, what else? Um, As a Man Thinketh by James uh, Allen. My favorite yeah. book. Yeah. It's such a good book. Yeah. The other one I really like that's not in the same vein but is an amazing book is uh, Endurance by Alfred Lansing. It's about Ernest Shackleton and his his trip his fateful trip uh, or attempted trip across Antarctica. Oh, okay. So that's a, that's a really good book. Uh, it's based on a, on a true story and what really happened to, to Ernest Shackleton and his crew. That's a good one. Uh, I mean, I've got to put a plug for my own book, sovereignty, the battle for the hearts and minds of men, which talks about how we can reclaim some of the sovereignty that we've given away to people, whether it's your employer or boss or the economy or your wife or friends or whoever else it is, our parents, we blame all of our stuff on. Right. Uh, but there's four or five, you know, that you can read that are very, very powerful. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Ryan, I really appreciate you, you coming on today. Uh, it's been awesome talking with you and you know, you're welcome back anytime. Thanks, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having me on. All right. Take care.